good morning or afternoon or whenever uh, it is when you're watching this, students. Happy to be back here. This might be my last lecture from the textbook. You never know. Um, the, the end is near, that's for sure. But I want to start off uh, at, at the end of chapter, toward the end of chapter 30, which I've talked about some other artists that um, are in that particular chapter. I want to, uh, I want to start with this artist. Um, this um, is a Joseph Boys, B-E-U-Y-S. And um, I'm actually, I don't like necessarily reading to you guys, but it, it, I, I think I'm not gonna do it justice otherwise. So bear with me with this, as I talk about this artist who I think is of great importance, um, or was, and unfortunately, he's no longer with us. Uh, the German artist Joseph Boys. 1921 to 86, was significantly affected by World War II. He flew a Stuka for the Luftwaffe, and I apologize um, if my German is not good, and was shot down by the Russians in 1943. So unfortunately, um, Joseph Boys was um, part of the German army and, and uh, apparently at the time a fan of Hitler's. Um, but we'll move on. Uh, this led Boys to construct an autobiographical myth that continually informed his art and has become a staple of art world mythology. According to Boys, he was rescued by Mongolians of Central Asia, wrapped in animal fat and felt, like felt blanket, which kept him alive. Boys viewed this event as a kind of resurrection through which he identified with Christ. Compelled to atone for the German atrocities of the war, Boys was drawn to mysticism and spirituality and projected the self-image of a shaman on an international scale. He set out to cure the social, economic, and political ills of the world, and to this purpose he dedicated thousands of drawings, sculptures, and above all, a series of carefully choreographed so-called action sculptures with moving figures and music conceived of as neither happenings nor performances, but containing elements of both. Boys believed in the spirituality of animals and in the spiritual and art. As a shaman, he played with the boundary between human and animal, just as politically he worked toward uh, peace among nations and cultures by crossing borders and merging boundaries. In 1974, Boyce performed one of the most famous action sculptures, Coyote, I Like America and America Likes Me. It, he arrived in New York City and was taken wrapped in felt by ambulance to the Rene Block Gallery. For a week, he and a live coyote, a wild one I might throw in here, performed the sculpture on the floor of the gallery, which had a pile of felt for the coyote to sit on. 50 copies of the Wall Street Journal were placed on the floor every day as a sign of the financial values overwhelming modern culture. Boys was wrapped up in a uh, tent-like felt blanket with a tartar's crook emerging from the top. As he moved, the coyote moved and vice versa. Tied together by their gazes, at once united them and signifying their mutual suspicion, Boys and the coyote engaged in a dance calculated shaman-like to blur the boundaries between man and animal. Many meanings have been read into this performance, most based on Boy's autobiographical myth. The felt that kept him alive protects him from the wild and a wild animal, while the crook has associations with Christ as the Good Shepherd. To celebrate the plane crash and his rescue at the Eurasian border of two countries, Boy's tries to bridge the borders of human and animal of the Native American worship of the coyote and the white man's fear and hatred of it, and, um, and of modern commercial society, the value of a less technological age. Now, this piece was obviously done some time ago, in 1974. I had recently graduated, undergraduate from Bethany College. But as I reread this today from chapter 30, and maybe you, there's more to the story, it's on uh, page 544. I thought I wanted to start today's lecture by sharing that. Talk about zeitgeist. Um, and, and the zeitgeist of this piece and voice work in general certainly, I think, has great um, 
overlap with what could be an artist's um, work in today's world. So uh, Joseph Boyd's, I just have one image to show you that's his. And of course, having just read what I read, um, you can probably get this. Uh, the title is simply The Sled. It was um, created in 1969. And it consists of a sled, much like the one that he was saved on. It um, has uh, the felt blankets tied to it. And it also has a big glob of lard that you see there in the front, um, which of course, he, and he did, he did multiple pieces involving the felt, the lard, and the wooden sled, and so on. Some with multiple sleds, and, uh, and anyway. So we are really looking at extremely contemporary art uh, for this last uh, lecture, and uh, wanted to make sure that Joseph Boyce, he's not exactly a household word, is someone uh, that you are going to be familiar with in the future. Next, the artist here is Robert Smithson. Um, this is in your book, um, except of course I didn't write down the page, but it's in chapter uh, 30. Smithson is an earthworks artist, and this is his most uh, famous piece. It's called Spiral Jetty, and it was created in 1970. So that's not exactly new um, either. But when we, this is in the last chapter of the book, and so we see how far art has come and um, in, in so many ways, and how powerful these images are still. And I think uh, suggest that they're still alive with us today. Another view um, of this is here. And of course, uh, this was, uh, it's huge, obviously, so to appreciate it, you can only um, totally appreciate it from the air, which the first shot was, but now we're down walking around it, and then ultimately, when you, when you are, are able to see it, then you are truly unable to appreciate the complexity of it. The, the construction of it was done with, uh, with a lot of uh, men working together to arrange the stones and to create the spiral of this. So Smithson is a significant artist in terms of earthworks, uh, boys. These guys also, I would say, conceptualism is an aspect of their work, stylistically speaking. Another artist um, of note, and um, only one of these is in your is in your textbook, is Nam Jun Paik. N A M. J-U-N-E P-A-I-K Nam Jun Paik uh, was born in Vietnam. He's considered a Vietnamese American artist. And his work involves, and his zeitgeist of course, is technology. And this piece is actually, uh, well it started in 1974, but this is what we're looking at um, is around the 2000. Uh, so it's, it's not quite as far back as some of the others. And um, this is called TV Garden, and it's a room, and I actually saw this uh, piece. It was at the Venice Biennale, and you walk into a room, and there are plants and TVs all over the place showing different images. Um, the TVs are working. Um, they're not showing what's currently on television, of course, but, they're, uh, but we look at them as sort of abstract, non-objective images on the screens and is active, it's very active and therefore very interesting. He also has some whimsical pieces, obviously these two, uh, man and woman, are quite whimsical and interesting. Um, his uh, his uh, bill for supplies must be exorbitant because just imagine uh, how much it would uh, cost to uh, produce some of these things. Lots, lots and lots of TVs. Let's see if I can advance it this way. And here we have a really complex with neon and lots and lots and lots of TVs. Um, and um, the, the title of this piece escapes me. I apologize for that. But 
his titles, you know, are pretty much what they are. This it has something to do with a map, and I think we can see the shape of. I'm not sure which. Uh, yeah, I think it's the map of the United States, but I'm not sure. I'm not worried about that. I just want you to see these things and appreciate them and encounter them sometime for yourself somewhere along the way. Now, this is Judy Chicago coming up next. Um, and you might remember that when I was talking about Georgia O'Keeffe, one of the images that I had saved was the, the Georgia uh, dinner plate. And but this shows Judy Chicago's dinner party, a celebration of all these uh, women, artists, Dancers, I see Isidore Duncan down here. I see lots of, lots and lots of, of people that she was lifting up with her ceramic work. It was a 1974 through 1979 installation piece. Installations. Let me let me talk about what installations are. Installations are pieces of art. They're not they, they're not meant to be hung on a wall. They can have some of it on a wall, but it comes off of the wall. It's not a freestanding sculpture in many cases. It's frequently like an environment that's created by the artist, and they can be uh, quite interesting, and there are a lot of very uh, uh, contemporary installation pieces that are being created in today's uh, gallery world. The next artist is, was Basquiat. Now Basquiat was a young guy with incredible talent. As you can see here, his work is quite childlike, in some ways primitive, compelling, uh, whatever. Um, and Basquiat actually caught on really fast as a successful artist. He was from, I believe, the West Indies um, with his uh, uh, heritage, and but uh, certainly working in, in New York City. He became a, quite a celebrity overnight. He worked and collaborated with Andy Warhol, and that was a big, uh, big deal, needless to say. Um, and of course, successful with his own without collaborations. Unfortunately, like a lot of young artists who become famous too fast, he got caught up in lots of uh, dangerous activity and unfortunately died way too young, um, I believe, of, of a drug overdose. Uh, a shame. Imagine what, how, how many more paintings uh, could have been created by this guy. Um, his titles actually are, are uh, this, the title of this one, yeah, this one, is, uh, let me, let's see, Arras Con Polo. Um, I'm not sure the translation of that, but it looks to me like there's, there's turkey involved. Um, I don't know. There's a, there's a great film, uh, Basquiat is the name of it. Jeffrey Wright plays the part of Basquiat. Um, um, it's, it's a film worth seeing. I'm sure you can like, find it on Netflix, look it up, enjoy it a lot. Um, David Bowie plays Andy Warhol, does a great job of it. Now basically, I think um, the next time you see Basquiat's work in a gallery, and you very well might, it might not be one of the few I'm showing you, but I think as you walk up to it, you hopefully will, it will resonate, oh, that's gotta be a Basquiat. You know, I wanna emphasize that's part of what I wanted to impart with you as a class, with all of my art history classes. Not necessarily just these few, but the, to have a reason to walk into a space in a gallery and see something across the room and, and walk over to it because it, it, called, it is called to you and you feel like you've met it before. And be it a Cezanne or you know, Gauguin or Basquiat. That's what I always hope to achieve. And I think by and large, um, every once in a while I'm successful with that. Maybe somebody here will disagree or maybe somebody here will agree. By the way, um, I should also mention that Basquiat uses uh, acrylic paints, magic markers, uh, crayons. I did a lot of my uh, master's work using crayons because it was thought to be a child's material, and that's what I liked about it. Uh, and also collage. Um, so 
So I, I, I like the media that he involves himself with. And here is a triptych. Um, you know, he, I think, as I recall, I'm pretty sure, he started out uh, as a graffiti artist that got caught. And um, that's happened more than once. Uh, Keith Haring had the same kind of experience. And by the way, uh, I apologize for my last lecture where we got into post-impressionism and um, Vincent Van Gogh being one of them, and I had my Starry Night socks on, and I forgot to show you, but today I got my Keith Haring socks on. <laughs> oh, this. All right, in case you don't know, and hopefully many of you know and have actually seen this, it's the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. The artist is Maya Lin, um, M-A-Y-A-L-I-N. Um, and um, L I N N, yes. Okay, so there was a competition for this memorial that a number of artists got involved with, and Maya Lin's um, vision and, and idea was the one that was accepted by the panel of uh, judges. And um, it was before it was even constructed, it was controversial. First of all, there was objection that she wasn't a true American. And, and so how could somebody who wasn't a true American be entrusted with creating something as important as the Vietnam Memorial? And, and it had its challenges, that's for sure. And I remember them all too well. We're talking about 1982. And it was in the news a lot. And then there were protests against it, and there were protests for it. As you can see, the Washington Monument is, is in, the, in the background of this. So where it was placed and how it was placed, all this was very, very, very complex. And what, uh, and ultimately, it, Maya Lin's idea prevailed, and it has become a tourist destination that exceeds almost every other one in Washington, D.C., including the Lincoln Memorial, which I believe is in second place, most likely. The Martin Luther King Memorial is very touching and beautiful also. But there's something so personal and special about this one. Um, all the names of the victims and the tragic loss of life in that senseless, needless war are engraved at some point on this black marble, which as you can see, is reflective like a mirror. So it's not just the names, it is, the, it is the people that are there that are alive. And so uh, often these people are searching and they're, they're, they're guides and maps of this, uh, of where their loved ones might be if they're looking for particular people. So it's interactive in a way that a lot of art can be and fortunately is, but it's certainly not something that's framed and on a wall in the room of the gallery. And people are allowed to come and, and place things nearby their loved ones' names, so it changes constantly. And every one of the things left here is cataloged and saved, and I don't know in what kind of warehouse at this point in time, because I can only imagine the, the volume of things that have been collected and saved. Uh, back to my lens, Vietnam Memorial, you can see uh, there's no social distancing going on here. So you can tell it's not a, a slide that was taken any, in the last month or so. Um, hopefully it's a slide that can be taken someday again. Who knows when that might be. But as I mentioned, it is a very popular destination for people uh, during moving experience. And uh, Maya Lin has done some amazing other sculptural work. Uh, she did a beautiful um, Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. sculpture in Memphis, I believe that I've never gotten to see live and in person, but you can Google it and look it up and feel the power to seeing pictures of it. Here's another um, kind of typical opportunity that takes place here when somebody finds the person that they're looking for and uh, want to celebrate that life. Um, very moving uh, photo approaching it. The next artist is one of my 
artists, plural, a pair, two of my heroes of art history. And that is Christo and his wife, Jean-Claude, C-H-R-I-S-T-O, J-E-A-N-N-E, hyphen C-L-A-U-D-E. Um, Christo and Jean-Claude are conceptual environmental artists. And this piece that we're looking at was called uh, Running Fence, was created in 1976, quite some time ago, in Marin County, California. And what is so powerful, there's a wonderful film. Oh, there's several films uh, about Cristo and, and his pieces of work. There's a wonderful film on Running Fence. And what's wonderful about it and powerful about it is it's not just how it looks, it's just everything that goes into it because it involves, in most cases, lots and lots of bureaucracy and red tape. We'll see some other pieces in a moment here. In this case, uh, Christo and Jean-Claude had to knock on doors of farmers and homeowners because the fence needed to run through their yards. So imagine, um, these, these aren't people, sophisticated people that know much about art or art history. So the interaction, the human interaction that needed to take place with each one of their pieces and or political interaction is just uh, hard to imagine. It takes lots and lots, it took them lots and lots of time and years for each piece to ever come to fruition for these reasons. So this, this ran all the way out in, into the ocean. Um, and of course, uh, the other thing is it has to be extremely well planned. And one of the important things about Christo and Jean-Claude is that they accept no money, no grant money, uh, no money from um, a National Endowment for the Arts. They created themselves by having, by getting money for lectures, for doing uh, collage, preliminary work, and selling those. Um, and, and it's their, their whole shtick is to completely be self-sufficient in terms of this not costing anybody other than themselves, anything. Uh, also, they totally clean it up when it is done so that if anything, the, the land involved is cleaner than it was when they found it. And all the materials in every one of their pieces that they've made is recycled. So it, it hits all the right points uh, in terms of artistic responsibility uh, and sensitivity. Some other views here. I think, as I recall, it was 21 miles long. Um, again, I didn't refresh myself last night with, with this information for lots of reasons, by the way. I'm pretty tired. I, I don't know about you guys out there, but this online distancing stuff and staying at home and not, uh, anyway, I think it's pretty exhausting. So I hope you're all doing well and staying well. That's the most important part. And let me interject here. I don't think it's any time, any time soon to start uh, reopening stuff and getting out there and doing stuff with a, with a lot of people around. So I don't care what Donald Trump says. Uh, unfortunately, too many people seem to be buying into that. And, and we're all, you know, we're all dealing with cabin fever. I get that, but we can't have a resurgence of this. All right, speech over. Okay, uh, running fence. Uh, that's my last shot of it. But now we're going to take a look at this piece. The Valley Curtain is the name of this. Uh, you might recognize this color. We'll talk about why you might recognize this color in a moment. Uh, this is um, in the Grand Canyon, I'm fairly sure. And you actually can drive under this. You can't tell that from this particular uh, slide that I have. And it's the only image that, that Art Store had for this. So, so you'll have to just imagine that you can see uh, and, and by that, I'm telling you, the scale of this can be kind of misleading because it's, it's giant. And um, anyway, this, this was a piece, uh, uh, this is an earlier piece than the last one we saw. Now, if you took Art Fundamentals, you saw this piece, but not from uh, this particular angle. This is in Berlin, and it's the Raft Reichstag. Um, it's, it's obviously, it's a, it's a 
office building. It's an important um, government, city government office building that they completely wrapped in uh, this white fabric. And if you'll notice, um, the crowd around here, this I believe is one of the days when it was um, a first um, wrap. Now it was wrapped, I think, for six days. All the pieces uh, that the Christians create are temporal. That means that they're just, just there for a very short period of time. And that, that matters a lot. I mean, that's, that's the zeitgeist right in there that uh, hopefully um, we can feel if something is there. It's not going to be there much longer. And of course, in this case, it couldn't be there much longer because the building could not be serviced or could not be used for its purpose uh, while it was going on. Um, again, all these were drawn and pictures of them and whatever. Um, way in advance of the project ever being understood or accepted. Of course, they have, Christo and Jean-Claude have made a name for themselves uh, over the years of being significant American artists. And uh, so it's, it has become easier for them. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. And uh, unfortunately, Jean-Claude has recently died. And uh, I'm not aware of what Christo is doing now, but the last collaboration that, that they had was, um, is, is uh, coming up soon. And it's this. So I was reminded uh, that I started this class while we were waiting for books and stuff to arrive. Started this class by showing the film about the gates, the gates that were done in Central Park uh, for 16 days in um, 2005. Something I tried so hard to get to and unfortunately missed. And um, so, so those of you that were here that day, and I think everybody was here that day to see this, we have a saffron color again that's from the Valley Curtain. And as Jean-Claude explained about the reason they love this color so much is because it changes. It's, it can be a deep crimson, it can be a gold, it, it has all these different aspects of color change. And certainly as you're walking through Central Park, experiencing this, it has, this piece in particular has this joyful, I think, exuberance about it. But again, I'm still sorry I wasn't able to get there. Uh, a friend of mine was able to get there, and I have a little piece of it, because when, when they took it down, and again, every single piece, every single piece of metal, you might remember this, you saw them installing it, and then you saw them taking it down. Don't forget about that. Um, don't forget about a lot of this stuff, people, because in one way or another, it all matters. And I hope you know that. So it took Jean-Claude and Christo 25 years to go through all, jump through all the hoops for this piece to become a reality. The permits and all kinds of complexities. And uh, fortunately, Mayor Bloomberg of New York City, former mayor of New York City, was a fan, a supporter, and that's what the arts need, is a fan and a supporter that understand the importance of art. It is not a luxury. It is, it is a sign of our culture. It's a sign of what's important uh, at any given time in history. Um, and, and so therefore, let your, wrap your brain around the fact that it, with all that had to be done here, it took a quarter of a century 25 years to get all that in place, to finally have it born, as it were, to see it. And back to where we started also, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo took four years, somehow, four years for him to not only paint this, but he had to design and build a scaffolding to get up there to do it. He had to, to draw the images that were going to be frescoed up there. Um, 
which meant that you know patterns had to be made and so on. And, and he had interruptions from Pope Julius II. So this is obviously so different uh, from what we just saw with Christian, Christian and Jean-Claude. And so I just want to juxtapose these two things as sort of um, where we began in some ways. I know this is high Renaissance. We started with pre-Renaissance and Giotto. But this to me is one of the most magnificent works of art ever created by a human. And also I want to say that the collaborative works by Christian and Jean-Claude are equally important for so many reasons. And that being said, uh, let me glance down here and see if there are any, there's any final thought uh, that I want to talk about this chapter. Um, there is, um, I'm gonna, so this is, this is the art history part that is going to involve your final exam coming up soon. Um, and I am, as I, I sent you all an email last night, let me remind you that I'll be sending a study guide to all of you. Once it's uh, polished and complete, it will be coming out this weekend. It's going to be on email. Uh, if for some reason you do not have the capability of, of printing the study guide, it's very helpful to have it printed, I think. If you'll let me know that, I will pop it in an envelope and get it to you. So if that's you, let me know. Give me the best address to use and it shall be on its way Monday. Okay, now, I'm still uh, a little bit unaware of exactly when your final exam, what day it's gonna be. Some of you probably know more than I do. Uh, but the time thing, now that we're not together, uh, may have shifted. But uh, we'll make sure that everybody has understanding of that. But for now, I'm gonna say, um, Arrivederci, ciao, and I'll be back in just a bit with, uh, with something I want something else I want to say to you. Thanks.